speed. David, many thanks for taking part. Can I just ask you, first of all, to introduce yourself, your CV? Uh, well, I am uh, Chief Executive of Local World, which is a company that I founded, and we acquired the titles from Northliffe and Isliffe families uh, three years ago. And how did you get started in the media industry? Uh, as a journalist in Belfast while I was at university. Is it true to say that you've pioneered a radical change throughout your career? Um, radical or just through necessity um, is hard to argue uh, which is which. Um, obviously the most contentious episode was the reform of the Mayor Group after Maxwell's death. Uh, the company had been plundered of 500 million sterling and we had to restore the pension fund and we had to make efficiencies and that was a uh, reformist action whether it was radical or not uh, is, is highly debatable it was necessitated by the economic circumstances of the business that either was going to survive and the national papers were going to survive if there was radical restructuring or they could have been closed and the banks would have simply liquidated the business uh, we chose to make a radical reform of the business, which was very controversial because quite a few journalists were, were dismissed at that point. In your blueprint for local world and the future of local journalism, you say the role and scope of the journalist needs to be re redefined. Can you elaborate? Well, it is being redefined because today we are all journalists. And if you look at how our children use technology, they're communicating on a number of devices all the time. So in essence, uh, the community have all become publishers and we need to harness that and create journalism from it uh, because everybody has the power to communicate. And when I started in the industry, tabloid newspapers were really the only vehicle where you could communicate across the mass of the country and it was very effective and it was very structured and disciplined and of course it was confined by physical limitations in print and geography. Today there are no such confinements, no such limitations and everybody wants to join in, it's become a two-way street. So journalists have to change their role to become editors-in-chief or publishers themselves um, and to harness this power of communication within the community and make sense out of it. And that is a very uh, overwhelming uh, challenge for uh, the industry. And if we don't do it soon, somebody else will do it for us. In your blueprint, you say there will be just one command layer within the modern content department. Please say more. Um, one command layer is effectively the journalistic resource uh, which will not have the, the, the structure of vetting and sifting and rewriting that the current industry still engages in. The world does not wait for that process. The world wants instant gratification. They want the community to produce the content and for that to be published instantly. It doesn't necessarily have to go through journalistic hands in the first instance, but once it has been published, then the idea is that the journalist can intervene and manage that content and make it more effective and m make it mature over minutes or hours or even days. But the first job of the journalist will be to make sure it's published, that the world can see the content. And therefore, the idea of journalist as publisher will emerge, I think, from the restructuring that's going on in the industry at the moment. You say news editors will be defunct. Why? News editors are defunct uh, because the traditional role of the news editor is to come in with a list and tell everybody what he considers or she considers, mainly he still of course, uh, what a good story is and rank those stories. They're defunct because the audience tell us what, they're in, what content they're interested in and very often that is a surprising judgment by the audience. It may not be a rape or a murder or a drug raid, it probably isn't uh, what they'll be interested in will be things that are much more um, uh, community-minded, uh, much more general interest, much more lifestyle. So, for instance, one of the top ranking stories on this very day is not murder or mayhem, it is the opening of a John Lewis store in Cheltenham. That is the big story uh, in one of our regions because 
it enhances the lifestyle of the people who live in Cheltenham. They're making the choice. We don't need a news editor to tell us that anymore. You say only a handful of content managers will be office bound. How come? Well, because uh, this is something that uh, has existed for many years in my thoughts. Stories, content is not in a newspaper office. The stories are out there in the community. We need to have our journalist publishers embedded in the community. We don't need them through modern technology to be sitting in an office chatting up the secretaries and keeping warm by the radiators in December. They should be out being part of the community. And it's not just the traditional beat that a reporter would cover. It's their entire lifestyle, their network. Everything that happens is content and it's no longer confined by uh, 48 pages or 64 pages. Everything is publishable. Every journalist that uh, we employ will and does produce pictures from their mobile phone and, and video uh, and upload it. And it may not conform to the old definition of news, but it is something that's happening within the remit of any local publisher and we need to publish more of it. Uh, we need to be comprehensive. And the industry, getting moving the industry away from uh, this idea of vetting everything and sifting it and then narrowing it down into a very uh, particular agenda, we need to change to be more comprehensive and publish everything that moves in the community. We need to be a one-stop shop. You say the old-fashioned publishing structure that added, acted as a hydra-headed nanny will no longer exist. What does that mean? Uh, I suppose it's the, the, the old argument about how many pairs of hands uh, does content have to go through before it reaches the public. Um, my answer to that is, you know, we must dismantle any of those structural impediments to instant publication. And the operating model that we're devising here at Local World will allow the community to go directly to publication without going through that editorial structure. Is your vision a stripped down virtual newsroom? Well, I think newsroom is uh, an expression of the past. Um, I think where you have the philosophy that the community provides the content, because everybody's capable of providing content, uh, I think that is, uh, doesn't require a newsroom. It does require individu individual journalists to cover uh, particular segments of activity, for instance schools or policing or traffic uh, or even weather or even bus timetables. The journalists will preside over those segments and they will preside over geographical areas as well, but they will do that like a, an all-embracing publisher. So the, the old idea of a newsroom, uh, again with the news editor, is, is not really relevant to this modern view of local publishing. Is the driving force cutting costs? Absolutely not. The driving force is much more to do with local publishing reinventing itself as the only place the community needs to go to engage in um, a, a, an activity driven by content. And in the past, newspapers lost a plot. You know, they lost a plot because they were confined very physically in how much content they could run. They had to make a judgment of what content people were interested in and gradually they lost touch with this structural change that was going on where instead of making an appointment with the newspaper or indeed making an appointment to watch broadcast television, people sought content out for themselves and if they couldn't get it from the confines of the Leicester Mercury or the Nottingham Post, they would go elsewhere. And that is very evident in our children who are not interested in having TV sets in their bedrooms. They're interested in sitting with their laptops and accessing content, whatever content they want, and using that content to communicate with each other. We, as a, a, a publishing industry, have been too slow to join that revolution. We're not the masters of content anymore the public are the masters of content and we need to facilitate that. So is your vision the end of journalism as we know it? Uh, no, the journalistic skills are still the fundamental requirement of any journalist publisher. And 
And we shouldn't forget that, of course, journalistic skill has been absent uh, in um, some of the, the great national newspapers that we, we have in the UK and has led to considerable um, errors of judgment. And I think, uh, fundamentally, those journalist skills have never been more important, but they're only a very small part of what people need to do. So the discipline and the training needs to be there, but the skills have got to be widened into a job which has got greater responsibility, you know. And, that, and that's not happening in, in certain quarters. I mean, I, I imagine that if I was to go into a tabloid national newspaper today, the sub-editorial culture would still be there, where a journalist does a very minute amount of work in contributing to the paper. In local publishing, A, we can't afford that luxury, and B, it doesn't do the job effectively. So I'm saying that as well as the journalistic skills, what we need is uh, journalists to be um, much more able to make publishing judgments and direct content towards publishing uh, without having to go through that structure, that rigid structure of vetting and sifting and then publishing. Uh, the world's moving too fast for that. Now, in highly uh, refined national newspapers, I'm sure this culture of sub-editorial vetting will continue, but in local publish publishing, our job is immense to cover all the territory and of course we have the ability to publish instantly online so I think getting the message to the public is much more important than adhering to those old-fashioned uh, restrictions uh, of the the typical newsroom. What drives you? I think this is the most exciting time in publishing that we have faced in decades. Um, it does empower the journalist be very much more than a cog in a machine. Um, so I say to, uh, and I see it uh, in, in the young journalists, I say to them, you know, you've got potential now to do something that really will give you job satisfaction, which will make you feel that you're in command of your audience, that you will be able to handle many times the amount of content you could handle as a reporter in the old days, in the 70s or 80s or 90s, today you can comprehensively serve your community across many different elements of content and, and we can rebuild local publishing uh, to be a force in the land, uh, but not in the old-fashioned manner. It, it, it is different, but this is a job. As a journalist stroke publisher, you will be able to command more responsibility and ultimately you will, you will earn more money as well. Uh, because the productivity will hugely increase. Our audience can be built beyond it, anything we've imagined so far. So with declining print circulations, audience can build you know, many times what it is at the moment. And you know, we've demonstrated that in three years at Local World, where we've uh, quadrupled the audience um, we, we've, with the same number of staff, because uh, we are now bringing in content we would never have dreamt of publishing previously. So this is the most exciting uh, era in journalism, uh, certainly in my career. Have you modelled yourself on Rupert Murdoch? I have been influenced by Rupert Murdoch, as I think everybody in our industry has been. Uh, now, what, what are those influences? Uh, I think the, uh, it's basically, basically entrepreneurship. You know, that you're not satisfied with uh, circulation at its current level. You're not satisfied with audience at its current level. There's a willingness to compete uh, against other media. Now, I'm not sure the industry has to a man followed that. Uh, and of course, there's a, a great deal of criticism of Rupert Murdoch, uh, even contempt for Rupert Murdoch. Uh, but the lessons we learn from him. Uh, of competing as media operators rather than s simply thinking we've, we've got some mission in life uh, as, as some journalists and some media organizations that don't need to make a profit, they, they will uh, continue along that path that their existence is a God-given one. Uh, whereas I think Rupert Murdoch considers that media is like any other business and you have to earn a living. So I think uh, those lessons and influences are important uh, and uh, 
I have certainly learned by them. Um, but I think as a role model, you probably, you probably wouldn't pick um, Rupert Murdoch as a business man and the example that he's set in terms of building media businesses. And I think it's a, it's a very valid uh, exercise to follow some of those lessons. Does waste disgust you? Uh, I think disgust is a, not the right word, uh, but clearly wastefulness in any activity, uh, and we're all guilty of it, um, because we don't necessarily use our time uh, to the, the optimum. Um, uh, it, you, know, it, you, can't be, you can't perfect your working day uh, to, to get the most out of it uh, every day in life. Uh, but yes, I think productivity uh, and endeavor uh, needs to be part of any business, business practice. Um, and uh, waste uh, is, a, is a tragedy, particularly in the media because time is important um, and clarity of communication is important and to some extent striving for perfection is part of what we do in, in the media um, and of course there is not, it's not the same as some other um, cultural efforts. You know, if you make a great movie people will remember it in 10 or 20 or even 50 years you make a great front page, and we're just looking at the front pages of John Lennon because it's the anniversary of his death coming up. Um, but those front pages, and I was involved that day in the newsroom, um, I, I can't remember what the front page was. Uh, was it a good front page? Yes, I, I think it actually was, and we were comparing, comparing front pages. Uh, so you strive for perfection, you strive to be efficient, and I think that, that is part of uh, the media industry. You, and it, but, but of course it is true of all uh, cultural pursuits. You know, if you're uh, involved with music or with cinema or theatre, you're always striving for something special, aren't you? And I think the media I I is part of that. And, and wastefulness uh, will act against um, achieving a good result at the end of the day. What did you learn from working with Mr Murdoch while you were editor of the News of the World? Um, well, I did learn something that people probably would be surprised about. Uh, he is not an interfering proprietor, despite all the stories. Uh, I think I heard from him only on two subjects regarding content uh, in, in three years or so. And if you expand that to the eight years I was an editor, as I was an editor of today, as well as the News of the World, in those eight years, it was still only twice that I heard from him about an editorial matter. Once was when I objected and indeed killed a column uh, by Woodrow Wyatt because it was in support of apartheid. Um, and although I respected uh, you know, the views of someone that, that I didn't necessarily agree with, uh, but the second week he attempted to run a pro-apartheid regime column, I killed it. And uh, because there was a very strong link between Woodrow Wyatt and uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Rupert wanted to know why it offended Rupert, uh, Woodrow Wyatt uh, by killing his column. And I told him, and the column didn't appear. So he was interested, but he didn't overrule the judgment I'd made as his editor. Uh, and I consulted him only once uh, about an exposure um, uh, to give him a warning that he might be approached to try to kill that story. Uh, he was approached and he didn't kill the story. So my encounters with Rupert as a proprietor, with me as editor, um, I can say honestly that, that he, he, he wasn't interfering. What was the other story? The other story was about uh, Jeffrey Archer, who was of course exposed and we lost a libel action and then 20 years later uh, the damages were repaired uh, and Geoffrey Archer went to jail. Uh, were you surprised when Mr Murdoch shot down the news of the world? Yes, I think it was a bad decision. Why? Uh, because the news of the world was much bigger than any scandal uh, and very dear to the hearts uh, of people in the UK and it would have recovered from the phone hacking scandal. And I think 
you know, Rupert had a lot of things to think about. Uh, he is famously decisive. He clearly thought that this was a, a way to, uh, to deal with the crisis. I don't agree with that judgment. Were you sad? Yes. Uh, I have the distinction of having edited two papers for Rupert Murdoch, both of which he closed down, because he closed today some years earlier. Uh, and, and I think that also was a mistake because, you know, 300,000 buyers of today just walked across the street and bought the Daily Mail instead. And, and it was the greatest, um, it was the greatest um, a gift to the Daily Mail. So I think Rupert Murdoch should have stood in, stayed in the middle market and today should have survived. Uh, but again, that famous decisiveness um, on both those occasions, I, you know, I didn't agree with those decisions, but that's Rupert. He makes a fast judgment and he makes the decision and he's in a position to do that if you know, you're working in a, in a publicly owned company in this, in this country, as I did with the Mayor Group for instance, uh, then those sort of decisions wouldn't be possible. You would have to consult many people and get a, a board to endorse that sort of decision but uh, Rupert Murdoch is an extraordinary colossus who uh, doesn't need to consult people for what it effectively is quite a small decision within a, a great global empire that he's built up. What was the biggest challenge you faced when you ran Mirror Group newspapers? Well, the, the initial challenge, of course, was to, to revive the company after the abuses that um, Robert Maxwell uh, had had brought to the business, and um, the, the the newspaper and the, the various titles, and there were five national newspapers still are at the Mirror Group. Um, those titles were in relatively good health, uh, but the corruption with a small C throughout the business that he had effectively infected the business with, um, which was people living high on the hog and um, the offices were, were very much structured to support a management that was dependent on the proprietor. Uh, all of that had to be dismantled and uh, a different, if you like, somewhat Puritan uh, streak had to be injected into the company to resuscitate it and inevitably um, that was a and I think it's been described as a brutal process and perceived certainly as a, a brutal process. Nevertheless, it, it had to be done and uh, not everything we got right as a team. But you know, within a year we had relisted 60% of the company that the banks owned. Uh, we had 18 months we'd moved the company out of Fleet Street to Canary Wharf. Um, that had a uh, therapeutic effect on the business. And it went on then to, to acquire regional newspapers and, and move a, uh, on a journey towards being a much more broadly based uh, publishing company than it was when I went in after Maxwell. So uh, it worked and whether the methods were uh, unnecessarily harsh is, a, is, is arguable. Um, but we stabilised the company and it's gone on uh, to be a stronger company despite the fact that there's been a constant structural change. You know, the business is, is strong. It's, at the moment, uh, Trinity Mirror is debt-free. Um, you know, it's got a pension fund deficit, but then all mature publishing companies have got that. But nevertheless, all the titles are intact and in, in pretty good health. So when we did this 20-odd uh, years ago, um, it, it was emergency, uh, emergency measures because of the larceny of Robert Maxwell. Uh, what were you trying to do with live TV? Uh, well, t I, th I believe that, that um, obviously to diversify using the tabloid skill that we had was important and at that point uh, 20 years ago there was there was room for other broadcasters. I, I felt that was for certain. And, um, and live TV was an attempt at um, entering that market cost effectively um, and uh, it did cause a stir 
and it was entertaining on a shoestring. Um, what would have happened if I had not left uh, the Mirror Group? I, I simply don't know. But yes, w television was, a, was an ambition, um, uh, efficiently funded, of the Mirror Group at that stage. And I, I feel that um, it could have led somewhere. But was live TV before its time? <clears throat> um, it clearly was um, was the beginning of, a, of a, an exercise that might have led to uh, a much more refined TV uh, strategy, um, and it broke some rules, which is always good, like uh, many entertainment um, propositions. You 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 have to you have to make yourself different. And um, whether it was before its time or just different, uh, I, I'm not really able to make a judgment about that. Uh, but I think it deserved a longer run than it got. What do you think about the BBC at the start of the 21st century? Uh, if we are at the start of the 21st century, we seem to be well into it. Um, sure. But um, the BBC has got the most exciting potential, and I think that requ requires someone at the BBC or possibly a combination of um, government and the BBC to be very bold and my personal um, feeling is that the big opportunity is within the cultural segment that is we in the UK have got um, a very rich cultural life across theatre, cinema uh, music, uh, the arts, museums, we have just the most rich uh, tapestry uh, to weave here in broadcasting and therefore the BBC to me should be less of a, of a broadcasting corporation and more of a cultural corporation. The BBC, BBC should become the custodian for all of those uh, arts culture driven activities that are going on every single day in life throughout the country. Broadcast only scrapes the surface of those things. We have many talented people in all these cultural spheres. They never see the light of day and they're striving in every community up and down the country. We need to have a broadcasting organization which acts as the curator of those cultural events and pursuits. And the BBC can fill that role. Now, People will say that's an elitist thought, you know, where you're saying put serious music, opera, um, visits to museums on, on the agenda, at the top of the agenda for the BBC. But actually, I think we should be, uh, we should have a national broadcaster who does have an objective to raise the, um, the attention of the public to these levels. It's not elitist. It is, I think, something that provides a, a genuine public service. And the materials are, and we need somebody to harness it. I don't see there's anybody better than the BBC to do that. Uh, you know, we all have our thoughts about future funding. The technology exists to have premium BBC channels. I would personally pay for high-grade cultural programming. Uh, and I think a lot of other people would as well. So the, you can be very inventive with what you do with the BBC. But I think its greatest mission should be to promote and protect our cultural heritage. And there's, a, there's no lack of material. Is the BBC too big? Well, I would say it was too big because, you know, I, can, I could say any good media manage, manager can take 10, 15 percent, 20 percent of the workforce away and, and still have a, a very similar output. So yes, there's always room for reform, there's always room to paradigm management, uh, remove bureaucracy, uh, direct people to the front end of the business. I would say that that's what we've done in Local World and, and other newspaper companies that I've been involved in. So there's always scope for that, but I think the, the essence of reform of the BBC is about its content. That's what the BBC should be about, content. Let the the debate should be much more about content and funding or efficiency. If they get the content right, I think everything else can be forgiven. Do you think the licence fee helps or hinders BBC journalism? 
Uh, well, <laughs> journalism and the BBC is a very different matter to other content, um, and the BBC will always be subject to scrutiny, both internally and externally, because it's funded by the license fee. I personally prefer a free market where you have competing news organizations, and then the public can make their choice which programming they care to watch in terms of reporting. Um, I, make a, I make a choice every morning when I flick through the channels which, which news service I, I will consume on a, on a given day. Uh, but I continue to have to pay for the BBC service um, should we not have a choice as to which news service we want to consume and which news service we, we want to pay for. And would that strengthen the, um, the proposition of news reporting in this country um, uh, if you dropped all of the so-called safeguards uh, um, for integrity and, and also balance. Um, I don't think there's a perfect solution and I don't think the BBC, by the way, can ever hope to be perfect in terms of balance um, because even the judgment you exercise in how to lead a news bulletin is subjective. You know, so there is a bit of a pretense here that the only, only the BBC can deliver impartiality. I don't think that's true. I think all news broadcasters who are credible and authoritative attempt to reach some balance and they all have their own procedures and protocols to do that. So uh, relying on the BBC as the one impartial news broadcaster is, is, not, is not a very um, uh, practical thing. People are people and they make judgments and uh, they, will, they will exercise those judgments from their own personal prejudices from time to time. I, I think that's pretty intolerable for any news organisation to be subject to scrutiny on the basis that um, there's a licence fee. So it's an imperfect world, uh, but I don't think, I think it's going to persist. And then you, but there is, fortunately, there is some choice. There is Sky News, uh, there is ITN. Uh, you do have some choice, uh, possibly not enough choice. Well, so, as a funding model, would you favour a, a basic service for a basic licence fee and then a second offering, which is a subscription premium channel offering from the BBC? Um, I think certainly there is room for a mixture and I think people will pay for BBC services independent of the licence fee. And if you capture that thought, and you also capture the thought about how does the BBC develop its content along these cultural grounds that I'm suggesting. I think there's a very exciting future for the BBC, but they've got to get out of this defensive attitude. The, you know, the, the idea that a, that a manager in the BBC can cajole the people who appear in the B BBC, the, the actors and the, the other people who are paid by the BBC, to jewel them into to writing petitions to save the BBC, that frankly is a nonsense. Uh, you know, they should be bold enough to say the BBC has got this phenomenal history, it's got this capability, now what are we going to do with it in the modern era? What does the market not supply and how are we going to fill that need? Now I, I think that's beginning to happen and I think that, that the, the fresher minds within the BBC are moving towards an innovative approach to content. Uh, for instance, I understand that there is uh, an effort now to fill the democratic deficit of reporting courts and local government. And the BBC will help to fund that and that content will be made available to all bona fide local media organisations in collaboration with the regional newspaper industry. Now that is a very bold move. It fulfils a, a public service need it is good for democracy to expose courts and local government to this sort of detailed professional reporting. We're beginning to see a movement in the BBC which is much more creative in terms of changing the content agenda. So I'm optimistic and I think given there's also technology where the BBC can charge a premium for certain content to certain people, that's an opportunity as well. Do you think the internet will eventually kill off television? Um, I think broadcast, uh, making an appointment to view, 
in the old way is unlikely to be the, the, the economic model of the future. Uh, content on demand is what I see the younger, younger generation engaging in. They find content, the content they want at any given time. Um, it is very rare that my children will actually say, oh, there's a program I want to watch at 8 o'clock on Sunday evening. You know, you get the, the flurry of activity and communal interest in things like Downton Abbey, but it's, it's, it's not a daily routine anymore as it used to be. Uh, so I think um, what people want is access to content when they want it, and they very often choose uh, content that, that might be obscure, not mass popular at all, and they fill their uh, they fill their their hours where they're communicating in in different ways than picking up a newspaper or switching on the TV. Um, we're we're on a journey in this respect. Uh, it's a journey where there's immense opportunity for conventional broadcasters and for conventional or traditional publishers. Um, but we have to move very rapidly or somebody else will, will take away our living, uh, whether you're a broadcaster or, or a publisher. Um, so the means of communication through the internet is certainly going to dominate how we behave uh, as broadcasters and publishers in the future. And finally, thinking about terrestrial television, do you have any sympathy with people who say there are too many channels but nothing to watch? Um, I think that that says more about the people concerned. Um, and also, you know, the myth of American television is just that. Lots of channels, nothing to watch. You know, the Americans make good television. Let's face it, we, we broadcast it in the UK, so some of it must be good. Some of it's on the BBC, so some of it must be good. Um, and again, people dismiss the Italians or the French. They all make good programming. You know, they make good detective series. You know, the, 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 the French have got their gritty version of Morse and so do the Italians. The Germans make excellent cultural programming. So let's be a bit real here. You know, there is some sort of myth that only the British can make good television and only the BBC can make good television. This is not true. The rest of the world is out there and they make good television, they make good programming, they make good, good content. Uh, so that's, that's something we should dwell on. We're in a competitive global world and we have to do it better all the time. David, many, many thanks. <coughs>